Great. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm uh, blown away to be here of the team. I'm uh, really the one who has the least exposure to open hardware. And I've just been uh, absolutely blown away by this community today. And I'm an honor to be a part of this. My name is Chris Neidl. I'm one of the founders of uh, the Open Air Collective. I'm joined by my partners in this, Matt uh, Parker and Kristen Ellis. The Open Air Collective is a newish, 100% um, volunteer based community uh, that's focused on advancing uh, climate change solutions that remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, we got going in New York about a year ago, and in the last few months, it really started to ramp up, and, and now our member profile is more national and, and even global. Uh, we operate in two different domains. Uh, we uh, are having an impact in uh, policy advocacy, where we're pushing for pro-carbon removal policies at the state and city level, and we're also active in open R&D, and that's what we'll be talking about uh, today uh, with Project Violet. So. Violet is uh, one of our founding missions or projects, and our goal here is to introduce what we think is the world's first miniature direct air carbon capture machine, or DAC. DACs are machines that chemically absorb carbon dioxide directly from the air. And uh, what we're working to do is to introduce uh, this technology next month under an open hardware license uh, and to build a community that can help advance and evolve it uh, over time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just provide a little bit of a background on DAC and why that matters to climate and then why we think open source matters to DAC. And then I'm going to hand it off to Kristen, who's going to give you a sneak sort of preview and a tour of the prototype of Violet uh, that's currently underway. And then Matt is going to uh, wrap things up for us and tell you a little bit more about our community and how it's evolving. It's still young. Uh, and ways what's going to be happening in the next uh, few months and ways that you can get involved. So I'll go ahead and get started. First, why DAC? Why does this matter as part of the climate conversation? To answer that question, you really have to start from just a recognition that we're now at a point where stopping future emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases is no longer enough. Even if we were to move at Green New Deal speeds, we also now, because we've waited too long, have to take carbon out of the air in order to prevent crossing a 2% uh, two degree temperature increase, which could, it's generally agreed, triggered all sorts of irreversible tipping points that would be disastrous. So negative, emiss negative emissions have to happen. And we have to remove a lot uh, of carbon uh, over the remainder of this decade. Uh, it's estimated that uh, by the middle of this century, we need to start removing, we need to be ramped up to remove 10 gigatons of carbon per year. And by the end, 20 gigatons of carbon per year. And I'll post my sources in the chat after this. That sounds like a lot, 10 and 20 gigatons per year, and it is. Just to give you some sense of proportion, uh, the, all of the cars on the road in the United States, the largest car market in the world, produce about one gigaton of carbon uh, per year. So this gives you a sense of how we have to be mobilizing very quickly. Now, there's ways that we can already do this, and many of you are probably already thinking about it, and ways that are inherently valuable in their own right and that generate all sorts of social, economic, and ecological benefits. And here I'm talking about... Uh, reforestation, afforestation, land management in general, soil management. And these are things that we should be doing and must be doing. I'm, I'm talking to you actually from a, a cloud forest in Costa Rica. Um, so uh, these are things that we, we, we need to proceed with, but it's not enough uh, to close that gap. Um, if we start to ramp up afforestation, even if we were able to, uh, to scales where we're really biting off chunks of that 10 and 20 gigawatts, we start to very quickly start competing with land for food production on a planet of 8 billion people. This is also very hard to measure the amount of carbon that's being drawn down and to verify that it's happening. And with these types of distributed uh, bio solutions, uh, permanency becomes an issue as well. Over the long term, can we bank on the carbon removal potential of these assets? And just a stark reminder of how those permanency issues come up. Uh, we can just think of just last year, the president of Brazil was deliberately essentially trying to burn down the Brazilian rainforest, uh, the largest uh, single forest uh, sink for carbon on earth. So what we hope is that direct air carbon capture, and we're not alone, this is becoming a, uh, a, a more mainstream idea, can help close that gap of what we need to do for carbon removal this century that we can't do with bio solutions. And again, this is a picture of a, a direct air capture unit. DAC has some key advantages uh, relative to uh, biological uh, removal solutions like afforestation. One is it's just its potential upside of its efficiency, that it can draw down carbon um, theoretically at a rate of a thousand times that of trees. So that, that really begins to solve some of the land competition issues. Um, it has a upper limit of, of just an enormous drawdown potential of up to 40 gigatons per year, according to a 
a very well-regarded and widely read uh, meta-analysis that came out a couple of years ago. That's more than all the emissions that we generate currently on the planet. Um, so that's an enormous benefit. It's also easy to digitally verify on site how much carbon is being drawn down and measure that, which is really critical in terms of how that fits into carbon removal regimes and how they're credited. And you can really, it can happen anywhere. You can place it in sort of marginal areas where it's most affordable and ultimately it can be embedded into uh, into the built environment itself, almost in the same trajectory that, that solar uh, has. Um, but obviously with that, we have to remove it and put it somewhere, unlike with trees where that's built into the form. Uh, in the long term, we need to be pumping a lot of this geologically uh, into ground and hopefully mineralizing it, which is a very promising application that's been recently discovered where you can inject carbon dioxide into formations, porous formations like basalt, where it mineralizes and hardens uh, rapidly and securely. But in the meantime, we can also, it can hook itself onto major industries like agriculture for greenhouses and synthetic fuel production, which will neutralize uh, those sectors. And it also can be added to high magnitude commodities like concretes and plastics and biomaterials in the meantime, which will help us scale up DAC. Now, DAC is not just something that's on a whiteboard. Uh, there are a handful of, in addition to all the academic research that's being done, there's a handful of startups out there in the world with pilot deployments that are actually already operating uh, in Europe and the United States in, in uh, North America. But in order for DAC to really reach its enormous potential, there are huge barriers that are currently in place, challenges. Performance, it, it needs to be able to more efficiently draw down carbon more rapidly at a lower cost, both uh, financially, but at a lower cost in terms of energy. So we need to keep the energy down in order for it to have a net negative uh, impact. So these are some of the major challenges that stand in the way and generate some of the existing skepticism around DAC's future. And that's what Violet is all about. Uh, Violet is, is where we want to bring in the power of open source and open source communities to really uh, apply themselves to, to these challenges. And we think that open source is, unlike what the private and uh, public sector could do, we think that this is a unique moment for the, the, the real power of open source to be uh, unleashed in a way that really changes the world. And it's very cliched at a open source hardware conference to bust out a Eric Raymond uh, quote, but I think it's 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 powerful to sort of think about what is the sort of the fundamental transformational power of open source and how does that map onto climate change solutions and DAC specifically, but also vice versa. And this is kind of the crux of what our sort of theory of change is here or our, our, our intuition about what this project could possibly do. Climate change uh, has what we could call, you know, a broad constituency of concern. You know, I've spent my entire career as a climate renewable energy advocate. People want to be involved and are usually given a very limited set of options um, in, in terms of how they can volunteer. So we have a potentially an enormous number of eyeballs and brains and time and resources that can be pulled uh, into this project beyond the open source uh, community. At the same time, how that's directed DAC offers really interesting opportunities that the, the bugs are actually quite well-defined. So you can really focus that capability at very, very specific problems. But at the same time, DAC is still so new that the sector is undefined. The borders of our imagination around it have not been closed. So our ability to actually put our fingerprints on fundamentally what DAC means and can be and can become are really, really significant at this early stage. So that's what we want to do is we not only want to solve problems and develop a community around the solving of these of these common problems. But we also want to use our collective imagination by creating forms of DAC that can can lead to new applications that are not yet thought of um, in, in the world. And so I'm going to pass it off in a second, but just to give you a bit of background, this is actually an image of a version of our prototype, which we hope will be introduced and available to the public and, and licensed uh, next month. Um, the type of DAC that we're working on, there's a, there's a range of different type of DAC technologies that um, trigger the capture and release of uh, carbon dioxide in different ways. Ours is what's called a moisture swing. So it, it absorbs carbon dioxide chemically based on the humidity. So when, when it's, it's uh, dry, it absorbs. When it's wet, it releases. And this has some advantages from an open source perspective. Um, one is the actual chemistry that's involved is very safe and accessible relative to some of the other temperature swing, pressure swing. So you can, you can, it's widely available. It's a relatively passive, simple design with few moving parts and is in a low energy overhead from the start. And this promotes the ability for us to miniaturize and modularize it and therefore make it both available to a broad public to experiment with at an affordable rate. Our, our, 
our goal is to have it be under the cost of a fancy laptop, uh, basically, uh, to start with, and then obviously much cheaper going forward. The other thing we're really excited about is that we're not starting from scratch. Our key partner in this who is going to join us, uh, he's in China, is Professor Tao Wang. He's one of the leading research engineers on moisture swing. Uh, he studied with Dr. Claus Lochner, if there's postdoc at Columbia University, if some of you are familiar with this space. Klaus Lochner is the godfather of direct air carbon capture, one of the most seminal figures in this space still. And he's published many papers with him. He's currently at the University of Zhejiang in China, where he's been operating a lab for close to 10 years, focused specifically on that. And his hardware and chemistry is the basis of our starting prototype for Violet. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Kristen, who's going to give you a tour of what we're working on. Okay, awesome. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Great. Uh, sorry if there's noise, I'm in a coffee shop. Um, so I'm going to try to breeze through the prototype tour really quickly. Um, we're going to give a little tour of Tal's miniaturized DAC first, which we're basing Violet off of. Uh, so first, the overview. This should look really familiar to a lot of you open source hardware heads, uh, a lot of 80-20 and stuff in here. So sorbent is stored here. It both captures and releases CO2. Then we have the greenhouse where you can actually collect and measure the CO2. This is a great first application for scale down DAC. So plants use CO2 for photosynthesis and pumping CO2 into the greenhouse can help plants grow. In this case, Tao is growing flowers, but you could imagine being able to grow food and increased CO2 percentage can increase crop yield up to 20% in urban farms and greenhouses. So that's really exciting. Then you have measurement. What Tao is using is an infrared gas analyzer that's taking CO2 readings from inside the greenhouse and processing them through the paired software. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. A lot of the mechanics, again, look familiar, but here we have four sorbent blocks fixed on a motorized track. Those load and release CO2 based on humidity conditions. The sorbent blocks are probably an unfamiliar part to a lot of you. So these are made of fine powder or beads of ion exchange resin embedded in a polymer membrane. And you can see those membranes here. And these resins and most carbon capture sorbents are functionalized with amines. Now the resin is typically made from an inorganic poly polymer like polystyrene. The ion exchange ability comes from functional groups. The resins are multi-purpose. They can be seeded with different active compounds, but the amines are important here because that's what's used for carbon capture. And we don't have to get into the chemical stuff now uh, in the interest of time, but as a fun fact, we've been using amine chemistry for over 100 years. We started in the 1920s, putting it in submarines to scrub the air. We use it in the International Space Station, but it's typically been deployed in very tightly managed air conditions. So in order to optimize it for carbon capture in multiple environments, there's a lot of work to be done to determine the best chemical makeup of the sorbent. And you might need a slightly different sorbent composition in a more humid environment than you would in a less humid environment. The membrane is affixed to the frame in strips to increase surface area and airflow, and you can also optimize the embedded resin for airflow by decreasing the amount of cross-linking in the polymer. So the resin has a microstructure. Um, more cross-linking in that structure means smaller pores, more surface area, and less flow. Less cross-linking means larger pores, less surface area, and more flow. So you're always trying to strike a balance between surface area, which is the area that can actually be functionalized, and airflow, which you need to get enough CO2 in contact with the sorbent in the first place. So the sorbent's a little sticky, but really interesting. And so the moving part is the fun hardware part. Um, this part expands and collapses to modify airflow flow and exposure, and it lowers the fully loaded sorbent into the water tank to release CO2. The reason that this release happens is that water has a greater binding affinity for the ion exchange resin we're using. And if we play our cards right, we can exploit this reversible chemistry to capture and release CO2 very easily, as Chris mentioned before, with very low energy, simply by getting the resin wet. So the contracted sorbent blocks will descend into a plastic tank that'll collect the water from the spray, Water sprayed on the sorbet once it's in the tank triggers the desorption or the release of the CO2. The water collects in the water tank um, and you end up getting about a 5% CO2 gas concentration which is injected into the greenhouse via a gas transfer tube. Now I mentioned this gas analyzer before. 
This is what Tau is using to monitor the amount of CO2 in the greenhouse, but it's important to note that this software and components that Tau have been using are expensive and proprietary, and the thing I've just walked you through is Tau's very professional, expertly built version of a miniaturized DAG. Part of the advantage of creating an open hardware model is we can do the same thing more affordably and get it into more people's hands. So we're using the Sensorion SCD30 sensor, which when uh, combined with the appropriate library and an Arduino board can read out relative humidity, temperature, and parts per million CO2. And the code we've used for initializing the sensor and parts are already listed on GitHub. So here are some examples of things that we think our community could work on and solve that came straight from Tau. First, we'd like to reduce absorption time and increase capture kinetics. Right now, it takes about three hours to saturate the sorbent with CO2, and we'd really like that to be less than one hour. We could decrease the electricity load for the moving parts, like the fan pumps and motors, increase the percent CO2 concentration of the output gas by optimizing the sorbent and doing some mechanical optimization, and we could add dehumidification to universalized deployment across a range of humidity conditions. So. I know that was a lot, but next I want to pass it off to Matt Parker, who's going to be telling you a little bit about the community we've been building and how you can get involved. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, so I do want to talk a little bit about our community. Uh, a small group of us have been working on open air for a couple of years now, uh, but it's only the last few months that we really started to recruit uh, other people to our community, and it's really been overwhelming the response we've gotten. Uh, so many people really seem to connect with this idea of this technology. There's so many people right now who are passionate and uh, feel like they want to contribute to, to fighting climate change, so that's really helped us uh, activate our community. Um, most of our community engagement comes from a Discord server, which many of you are on. So maybe just jump on over to us. If you like. um, and uh, yeah, just this, this uh, nice little convenience. Uh, in terms of our open hardware work, uh, that's mostly taken the form of what we call DAC hacks. <laughs> uh, we've created a monthly gathering where we work uh, together. We are developing hardware together, mostly taking place at NYU uh, ITP. Uh, we've Tested sensor, sensors, tried out 3D component, uh, printed components, assembled rigid, tested sorbent, uh, and we believe we're really like one step away from getting our first actual functional DAC, uh, the or at least the science fair ITP version of it. And we're basing this off of Tau's technology, so we know that it works. Uh, we're just very close to, to to getting it working, and frankly, we probably would have had it working by now if it were not for Tau's lab and most of China getting shut down for uh, advanced periods of time. Uh, so March 7th, we had actually had our first uh, multi-location DAC hack. We, the version you're seeing uh, on the left side of the screen right now uh, was uh, built in San Francisco uh, at one of our members' labs with a, another uh, member over there. And then we also had a, a, the developed on the other side of the screen was uh, developed at MOU ITP uh, uh, at the same time. So we had sort of co-located uh, DAC hacks once the world returns to normal. We're planning on doing more of these at the, in the same time in different locations. Uh, but really, this is about the people. Uh, our community is really engaged and really awesome. Uh, we've had multiple uh, events. Uh, really, open air is about empowering individuals to fight climate change. Uh, and so we've had 3D modelers, printers, academics, chemists, uh, former submarine officer, uh, which uh, I think somebody mentioned in the, the Discord before and came up before that uh, They've been scrubbing CO2 out of uh, the air in uh, submarines for 100 years now. So this is proven technology that we're building on top of. Uh, we just have to figure out slightly different ways of doing it uh, in the context of, uh, of ambient air. Um, so obviously, our situation has changed a little bit uh, since March 7th. Uh, we're going to be going virtual, but we're still actually having our members communicate, share information, uh, continuing with the development. And uh, one positive side is that the things seem to be clearing up a little bit, uh, at least in the area of China, the Taoism. So we've actually started to be able to get more information from him in recent weeks uh, than we've been able to get over the last few months. Uh, so things are really advancing on our community side. Um, we uh, have several events planned for the near future that uh, are going to happen, right? Happen, yes. And if not, we will reschedule them, and I think everyone will understand. But uh, things are really progressing well for us, uh, and we are uh, really happy with it. And I think uh, things are advancing uh, in a way that 
will really help encourage our community. Uh, in addition to DACCATS, we are also uh, hosting and attending events about carbon removal so we can educate, learn, and grow our community, including uh, we've been at the March for Science Expo, uh, Marketplace for the Future at Climate Week, uh, Jumpstarting the Carbon Economy at uh, Columbia University, um, uh, uh, carbon removal meetups. Uh, we had have some activities to help encourage uh, people to engage with our advocacy side uh, because it's also something else, as Chris mentioned at the beginning, that we've been doing a lot of. Uh, we're actively working to promote carbon removal through advocacy. We are working with a New York State Assembly member. We got a bill introduced to promote green concrete, which absorbs CO2 and helps create a market for CO2 collected by DAC. There's actually a provision in the bill that incentivizes the concrete to be created with uh, CO2 that's uh, gathered through, from DAC. Uh, we're working on a budget request to fund a study on uh, the feasibility of combining wind power with DAC to pump CO2 under the seafloor, uh, where we if there's a lot of uh, evidence so far it would actually mineralize there in a short period of time. So this is sort of a, a sort of an end game for large quantities of carbon removal. Uh, so we're also working to figure out open source legislation, uh, which is something that we have uh, a real interest in in a way to expand our bills to other states uh, and eventually hopefully to the federal level and other countries. Uh, that's something we're working to expand through GitHub. Uh, so we'd love your help. Uh, we are a volunteer collective grant funded. Um, we'd love to have you involved with our work. Uh, there's info about how to join us uh, in the pin tweet in our channel on in the OSHA uh, server. Uh, we know that if you're here, you're probably an open hardware person, but uh, if you know somebody who is more interested in the advocacy side, or if you're also interested in the advocacy side, we'd love to have your help uh, on spreading this, uh, the bill uh, and subsequent bills in the future. Uh, so we're just really at the beginning of our journey here uh, and many hands make light work. So uh, please come join us if you're interested. Thanks.